Hello, everyone. I'm Priya from Samita. Welcome to the first of a three-part webinar series called Leaders with Purpose that we are co-hosting with IDFC Institute. We have a fabulous set of speakers whom we will hear from shortly. But before that, I wanted to spend a minute telling you about Samita's response to COVID. We've set up two alliances, the India Workers Alliance to provide immediate relief to our workers and help them get back on their feet. We're doing this through a combination of financial support and upskilling to create new jobs and livelihood opportunities. Our India Protectors Alliance protects our protectors, our frontline healthcare and sanitation workers. Our effort has already reached more than 35,000 migrant workers and protectors, and we're determined to get to a million soon. We're doing this by co-creating solutions in partnership with experts, corporate and civil society leaders, and the government. Our conversation today is exactly about that. I acknowledge that this is not an easy conversation. How can it be easy? It is, after all, a response to the most challenging of situations. It is difficult. It is necessary. It is our best bet. Talking, thinking, planning, acting together. I'm very glad that you're a part of it. A few housekeeping rules for all attendees. We request you to post your questions in the Q&A section only. All questions will be answered at the end of the session. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nachiket Moore, who will kick off the discussion with Nobel laureate Professor Esther Duflo, who I had the privilege of working with a long time ago. Esther, it's an honor to have you with us. Nachiket is the perfect person to host a session that encompasses Samad, Sarkar, and Bazar, since he's had a lot to do with each of them. Over to you, Nachiket. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, we, know, we now know that COVID-19 um, is a uh, serious infection that is amongst us. It has a unique mortality profile with an overall mortality number close to 1%, which is about 10 times higher than that of the regular flu, uh, but with the unique feature that older people above the age of 60 experience a rapidly rising mortality rate with the number going to as high as 10% for those above 80 years. We also know that the virus is highly infectious and is unlikely to be stopped without a vaccine, even with strong, effective, and universal lockdowns which are maintained until the vaccine is found. Having implemented the lockdown, India is now facing twin consequences of the disease and the lockdown. On the health front, until the vaccine is found with good supportive care, we can indeed reduce <coughs> mortality to some extent. And while it is clear what needs to be done, getting it done is quite a challenge. On the economic front, however, both on the economy-wide level as it, and as it concerns the very poor, what needs to be done is not yet clear. But we know that it will take the combined might of, as they say, Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar, which is the, uh, you know, the society, the government, and uh, the corporate sector and the markets to find and implement a solution. To help us think through this complex topic, I cannot imagine a better group of people than the ones who have agreed to talk to. Dr. Esther Duflo, a professor at MIT, was recently awarded the Nobel Prize for her role in the introduction of an entirely new approach towards obtaining reliable answers about the best ways to fight global poverty. Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, who will join us later uh, in the conversation, chairman and MD of one of the most mature consumer companies of India, which engages with virtually every aspect of the Indian economy, both urban and rural. Ms. Nisaba Godrej, Chair of Godrej Consumer Products, part of a group with a well-earned reputation for combining a deep social conscience with business excellence, and herself with a deep personal passion for education and well-being of girls and women. Ms. Renana Jabwala, National Coordinator of SEVA, which has a particular focus on the informal sector businesses, and she herself has played a pioneering role, amongst many other things, in addressing housing issues for the women of SEVA and Dr. Rukmini Banerjee, who is the CEO of Pratham Education Foundation. And she too, amongst many, many other things, has been the prime mover behind the path-breaking Asar report, which informs all of us of the true state of affairs in the educational landscape of India. I'd like to welcome all of you on my own behalf and on behalf of Samhita and IDFC Foundation. Let me get the discussion started with you, Dr. Esther Duflo. In your speeches and many recent op-eds, you've made a strong case for the use of the digital infrastructure that has already been established to ensure, ensure universal to near universal cash transfer. 
and on special measures that governments can take to ensure the availability of timely healthcare services to our large populations. This particular conversation is not just focused on the government and doesn't get into the depths of the healthcare sector, though we should certainly feel free to talk about both. But here, because of the audience that we have, the panel that we have, we'd like to focus on the corporate sector and the nonprofits and to explore what guidance we can get for them from the research that you and JPAL community have been doing for years. Some examples uh, of your areas of work that I felt we could get into somewhat is your work on the ultra poor. You know, how simply giving them money may not be enough. And that, you know, given the disruption their lives have seen, is there something else we could be doing as corporates, as civil society to do more than just give money? What about migrants? They're currently sitting at home. Are there types of training programs that are more useful than others? Will apprenticeship programs have a unique role to play? What about entrepreneurs, local entrepreneurs? Is there something that can be done unique for them by way of training, business skills, and other areas that you've spent so much time thinking about and, and JPAL has uh, that would be particularly helpful? And of course, is technology going to help us in any way? Um, you know, because we know that this very call is a good example. There's going to be an enormous investment uh, in technology infrastructure. Does it offer an opportunity? While there is the risk of the digital divide, do we see something in education and in acquiring acquisition of transferable skills? So there are many, many questions that you could uh, uh, illumine for us, Dr. Duflo. I would leave the floor to you uh, to talk about issues that interest you as well as some of these questions. Dr. Duflo. Antiket, thank you very much. Thank you very much all for being here. I'm not going to talk too very long to leave uh, more space to uh, to the other member of the panel, whom I think uh, who I think have more to more to say because they are closer to the front line of uh, both the uh, business world and the NGO world. Um, let me say a few things about maybe one thing about one thing we learned from the ultra poor research. Uh, what we learned from the ultra poor research is that there are something called poverty traps, which is their situation where when people are poor enough, when their life are disrupted enough, going out of them uh, becomes uh, extremely difficult if they don't get a serious hands up, not just a nudge, a serious hands up in the form both of a productive assets and of a lot of support to take care of these assets. And this is the precise na nature of the ultra poor program, which gives people something to start a business, but also a lot of support to get this started. And the point is that what we should avoid now to the maximum extent possible is many, many, many people falling into this ultra poor category which would in a sense be a sort of a trap in which they would be locked down and in which it's possible to get out through this help and through the ultra poor program, but much harder than if we avoided the poverty trap in the first place. Uh, which is why we have, uh, uh, both Sabedit Banerjee and I have really insisted on the need for the government to act quickly and swiftly to prevent a lot of people who are not ultra poor, but merely poor, or maybe not even poor, who, who, who start seeing of themselves as, as going out of the poverty status. The small entrepreneur that Renana is working with, the people, the migrant worker who are doing a good living in construction, and so on and so forth, to avoid those people to completely collapse back uh, at the, uh, in a situation where it would be much harder to get out. And that, in a sense, is something that would affect them personally. So there would be an individual poverty trap. And that could also create a society-wide poverty trap. Because if people have no money, and if they feel that there is no money coming their way in the future, they are going to stop buying anything. And therefore, all of the businesses that could employ people uh, will, even when it will be safe to produce again, won't be able to do it because nobody will be there to buy things. And there is in any way uh, a, a nation, um, an international crisis, which of course, you know, India cannot do anything about, but that is going to 
eventually have ripple effect on an Indian on the Indian economy uh, because there will be less purchases of uh, of of Indian products coming from India. But India is lucky in that it's a very large economy, and it is not very open. It is open. It is in principle open, but in practice, the ratio of import and export to GDP is lower enough because this is such a large and diverse economy. So in a sense, India has the possibility to insulate itself pretty much from a lot of what is happening worldwide if we manage to maintain the demand and avoid a collapse in demand. So even though this is not something that business can do on an individual way, that's something that is, I think, a responsibility of the government to ensure cash transfer. This is something business should be keenly interested in and very much behind, not, uh, not, as a, not just because it's the right thing to do morally, but also because I think it is the most responsible thing to do economically. So that's, you know, I understand it's not your question because you were asking about what business can do, but in a sense, self-interested business should be very much lobbying for this cash transfer. And anybody who is in the business of delivering the infrastructure for this cash transfer, telco, uh, uh, the development of electronic money, uh, should put all of their <laughs> all of their assets assets behind that. That's the that's the first point. Uh, now, on other things uh, businesses can do, I'm 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 very keen to hear from uh, our participant from Bazaar here. But a few things I think the. Unfortunately, until we find uh, a vaccine, which might take some time, I don't think the lockdown situation can last forever because people will have to you know, go out and eat and do things. So what business needs to start doing is, and not just in India, but worldwide is, what is the safest way to uh, operate uh, uh, or what is a safer way to operate? which maintains the health risk as a tolerable level for workers and allows them to restart working. And this is something that we, you know, this is kind of, we have to think of this in the early day of the pandemic. I think I was more optimistic that there would be a during pandemic and an after. And now I'm more thinking that even if we found a vaccine, even if we found a treatment, we should keep in the back of our mind that then there will be another one. And this should be a wake up call in thinking, how do we reorganize production in a way that protects workers from the possibility of infection, infecting themselves, et cetera. And that is true, I think, for people who work in factory, that is true for self-employed workers who put themselves at a, a ton of risks by uh, operating in, you know, in, in crowded conditions and so on and so forth. The third thing, uh, and that is something which I think is true, would is something that all of uh, uh, everyone should keep in mind. The government, the business, is an NGO, and the NGO is not to forget the rest. Um, for COVID is very serious. For the time being in India, it's actually less. It looks to be less serious than we feared for reasons we don't fully understand, so I don't think there is any reason for complacency. But we should not forget that there are many other problems that the poor people face and they have not gone away. Uh, worldwide, uh, in the same time that 200,000 people died of COVID, more than a million kids died before the age of five for reason, for, from diseases that are entirely preventable. And the ratio is probably much worse in India because there are not that many death, deaths of COVID and there are so many kids in India who in normal times are not immunized, uh, do not uh, um, live in conditions where people do open practice of open defecations, do not get ORS if there are diarrhea and so on and so forth. And one of the things that does worry me because I'm very, um, I've worked, I've done a lot of, of work on vaccination in particular is what's happening to vaccinations today. Is it continuing or has the government like kind of stopped offering the camps? 
And if it's not continuing, then there is an opening like right now for anybody who has willingness to do it, to organize uh, in a safe way and in collaboration, of course, with the government authorities to go back to do vaccination campaigns. Uh, so that kids don't go, you know, don't, we don't have many, many more kids dying of measles uh, because of, of this pandemic. And that's a problem worldwide. In India, the situation of vaccination was fragile enough that, that it could be a problem uh, much more than that. On education, I'm very curious to hear uh, Rukmini, obviously. Um, I, I think that there is a, a possibility of um, um, of a reset in a way, <laughs> the education the education system was not doing all that superbly before the the pandemic when they had the kids going to the schools. Uh, uh, maybe we should use the situation to think about another way to organize uh, education that uh, is uh, different. You know, using technologies, tablets, and so on and so forth. Certainly, one thing that we need to think about is when the kids come back, they would have been out of school for a very long time. We should not restart the curriculum, you know, assuming that nothing has happened. And that also is something I'm sure Rukmini will say more about, an occasion to start from the ground up and try, and try to put everybody back at the, um, at, the, at the basic level. And of this, I think, could emerge an opportunity. Uh, potentially, if we think about this straight. So one uh, question, Esther, that uh, I, I thought I might still uh, see if you had any added comments to offer, because the, you know, while you you make a very good point that as much pressure on the government to do its fullest uh, is in the interest of everybody, uh, but it is possible that whatever it does is not enough and that the local communities, local businesses, informal sector are left a little bit to their own devices. Uh, is there a role, for example, for a corporate uh, to help there? You know, I know your research has found that particular types of training are more useful than other types of training, particular types of support are more useful than other types of support. Is there some guidance we can give? Because many of the people in the audience are well-meaning corporates that are interested in doing more, well-meaning NGOs that are interested in doing more, anything that the research points us that allows the poor to take a little bit more charge of their own lives. Of course, not saying that therefore that absolves anybody part of their responsibility, but what can they do? And what can we all do to help them? So I, from the business side, I think there is a clear responsibility uh, of uh, uh, keeping as many people as possible on the payroll uh, to give them uh, um, confidence. It's not just the money today that is needed, it's the confidence that when it is possible to go back to work, there will be a job for you. Uh, so, and as you're keeping as many people as possible on the payroll, for some people, it might be an opportunity to reskill and retrain. In particular, given that there are new uh, things that people might start to need to produce, like there is a shortage of uh, PPE equipment worldwide, in India and worldwide, uh, uh, that this might be an opportunity to retool people, to help them out, to, to retool first, you know, starting with the equipment, but then also of the workers, of how can India turn out into a massive uh, PPE producing uh, um, uh, place. And that's just an example. But I think the first thing is, uh, and again, maybe that's not the answer you want to know, but the, uh, the first thing, in my opinion, is to uh, give people some sense that there is a future for them. And that's by ensuring as much as possible uh, some continuity in the employment situation of anybody who has a, a job, even as they're doing menial work that is not essential and cannot be uh, and cannot be done remotely. And then using this opportunity to retool people. This, I don't have very specific example of how to do it because I think it's very, it's going to be very business specific. Uh, but in every business, there is probably a discussion on what's the, you know, what are the production line for tomorrow and how do they need to be organized? And just having 
keeping in mind the entire chain of the worker from the manager to the lowest skilled worker and how to upskill upskill those skills in the context of this rethinking of, of your retooling is that it is is I would say the, the, the right way to go. Also at the in terms of the you're right about the, the any government system will leave holes. Um, uh, um, the very old fashioned way of providing support in the local communities in the form of uh, making sure, for example, very simple thing that any local leader can do, business or NGOs. Is, in Tamil Nadu, we have a survey of old people. And we, we, and it, we, we discovered before pandemic that a lot of old people live entirely alone, completely alone. And that is something that we didn't know, the government didn't know, nobody knew because we have this idea of the great big Indian uh, extended family. But in fact, a large number of old people live completely alone. We call them right after the pandemic and we find out that they all know there is a lockdown, but a whole third of them do not know why. They do not know the symptom of COVID. They do not know how it transmits. And they do not know what to do if they had uh, if they had uh, any any symptom, and this is the population of 60 and above that is the most vulnerable. Furthermore, although some of them get pensions, the pension is not physically getting to them. So some of these old people are just literally have nothing to eat. Uh, doing something for old people in the community simply by calling by organizing something among your employees and, and telling them, call an old person you know, and call a friend to then call an old person you know. Find, check out on them. Make sure that they call the helpline. That seems, that's a very small thing to do. It's not even money, it's, but it's something where you can engage uh, a member, you know, something with large NGOs like, like Pratham. You can engage your staff into this action. That's not what they do regularly but could actually save uh, uh, many, many lives, either from COVID or simply from dying of hunger because these kids are, these, these people are, are completely isolated. I understand that actually in France, uh, maybe, uh, you know, it's just something I read in health affairs recently, postal workers have been charged with the responsibility of visiting old people's homes on a regular basis and reporting back uh, to see what's happening. And, you know, the, in India also, the postal system is a wide system. I think it's a very important point you're making that we have to worry about these sub-communities that are vulnerable, that are particularly in need, just like the ultra poor, the senior citizens. What can we do about them? And, and to develop mechanisms that are uniquely Indian uh, to try and do it because the extended family doesn't quite extend as far as we originally imagined that it might. In France, we have the, the dubious benefit of the experience because during one heat wave a few years ago, many, many, many old people died because nobody checked on them. And that really forced a reckoning in our society saying, how can we let that happen? And in the following heat wave, no one died because there was a system to make sure that any old people were checked on. What I worry about in this situation in India is that we, there is some amount of complacency due to the fact that we believe we've got this. And what, what our research shows in Tamil Nadu, which is of course a particularly developed and, uh, state with where a lot, there is a lot of rural to urban migration and small families, so the problem might be worse. But what we discovered in Tamil Nadu is that it's not at all clear we've got this, but this is something that can be gotten. And it doesn't really require any government. It requires a bit of organization and using the social network to make it happen. But one question, uh, Dr. Dufo, that has been coming up quite a bit is the issue of migrant labor. You know, there's some concern, and uh, when I uh, go, go to Ms. Godrej, some questions I will ask her because of her engagement in the construction industry, and Madam Jabala will also have, I'm sure, important perspectives to offer. Do you have a sense of, I know this is maybe not an area that you're researching, but something that you might be able to give us some insight as to what do you see as the long term here? Because the migrants have moved back now. Um, you know, there was some, you know, halabaloo in Karnataka where the, you know, the, the 
migrants were stopped from going because there was a concern that the construction industry would suffer. Uh, how do you see the end game play out here? Um, any perspectives from you would be very helpful. So I think we should make sure to uh, to leave time for other panelists to, to speak on these questions. I'll just say one thing, which is uh, the migrant and the temporary migrant is for many poorer family a key uh, uh, element in the economic game that makes them tick. In many families, many rural families that we think of farmer families, actually their main source of living are the earnings coming from the migrant worker. So as these jobs de have at least temporarily disappeared, uh, and if they don't come back in the future in the same way, uh, this is going to be a major, major, major shock in the economic lives of many poor families. So that has two implications. One is that we have to think about whether and how it comes back. And if it's come back in particular, what is the housing situation of migrants? We've been totally content of letting migrants leave uh, in under bridges or on their work site in crowded conditions until it puts the rest of us at risk. But it was unacceptable then. And of course, maybe now this will force a, a, a reckoning of, you know, how do we, how can a better uh, housing situation be provided for temporary migrants? And the second is, how do you, you know, it's in the same way that we have to think about how do you reorganize production to make it, uh, to make it possible in a state where there might be this pandemic or the next one is, I don't think we should aim to curb migration because that's really a lifeline for very many people. But we should help the migrants throughout the journey to make it, uh, to protect themselves, uh, uh, to test themselves, uh, and in particular to be able to be tested before they come back to their communities. Um, and uh, so, so that the, the, they don't become a super spreader of this or the next pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duplo. Let me uh, turn now to uh, Ms. Godrej and to get her perspectives, both on some of your comments, but also a somewhat of a broader perspective. Uh, you know, your group, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, which is well known for a deep, deep social conscience, you're held up as the model. Uh, as to how a business group should operate. It would be lovely for a lot of our corporate listeners to understand how have you responded? Because in some ways, you are the benchmark uh, in this. You've always been closely involved as a group in the well-being of your employees, the communities you serve, your Udayachal schools. I know about them as they're just wonderful efforts. And I know you yourself have been talking about you know, the beauty entrepreneurs uh, kind of project, you've gone ahead and done some interesting work with the uh, construction industries so that the staff that are employed there, people that work there uh, are particularly taken care of. So, you know, you really have done some remarkable work. Uh, I, I'm eager to hear, as are I'm sure many people, uh, what uh, your perspectives might be. Uh, you will have to, somebody will have to miss. Um, sorry, um, sorry. Um, yes, uh, we could hear you. Yes. Sorry, I was I was on mute. My apo my apologies. Uh, so I was just saying thank you so much for having uh, having me here. I'll just jump in first with what uh, sort of Esther was saying, and uh, I agree that we you know we should talk about what corporates and what the NGO sector can do, but this is basically the world's biggest crisis and we need governments to step up correct and we cannot like churchill said it's not enough to do uh to do your best you must do what is necessary correct and the indian economy i'm sorry to say was in a bad state before this hit and we are in big trouble so i'm not an economist i don't have you know all the answers and you know we can have a very long debate on whether we should print money and send it out but we need to think big here and we need to move fast and fix this and we must do uh, what is necessary. And I do agree with the view that the government eventually has the most power to do this. Uh, that being said, you know, I, I think I do have a sense that, uh, you know, when you, as a corporate, you're 
a little bit left out on your own on this and i'll just give you my own personal experience we make basic necessities like soap to wash your hands we're being told this is the most important thing to do in an infection and we make things like mosquito repellent we're having dengue and malaria outbreaks in uh, west bengal and you know at the start of this it was it, it like a mosquito repellent was not even an essential service correct so i think there is that going on on the ground that it is you know and and i'm you know talking from the privilege of a zoom call with a lot of gratitude that my life is safe but i think there's just a lot uh going on i think the way we're thinking of it definitely uh you know as a corporate is that india was started in a crisis we started in uh india's freedom uh, movement so really if there was any time to step up and do what is necessary is now you know we started with a small 50 crore fund for the community we'll expand that um i i agree with esther we've we said that you know no we're not going to let anyone go even in the real estate industry we've been supporting all our construction workers ngos are very important to us at this time because we can't do this uh uh without them so i think in the short term we've sort of said we must do whatever we can for the community we must keep our workers safe and actually after the initial shock of the first week i mean within the company i said please hustle please get the soap out please get you know insecticide out because that's you know we we also exist uh, to serve our consumers and we must do it at this time i think i think one thought on shared value is sometimes we wonder what shared value is and you know we do these beauty printer programs and i think shared value right now is right up in front in your in your face uh you know i have to give my whole ecosystem covid insurance not just because it's the right thing to do like esther said but because i need them uh to be safe i need them to come to work i need them uh to be able to operate so i think i think the way we're trying to do think about it is how do you keep people safe and it's and it's safety is not just your um health safety but your mental safety that you will have a job and that we're going to move forward so lives and livelihoods what can we do uh for the communities and then how do we keep our how do we keep our businesses uh running against all odds that's a wonderful uh, set of comments ma'am and i can certainly see that you are you know thinking about this whole set of issues uh, fairly deeply and are engaging fairly quickly i think it's an important point you make that between you unilever and some of the other companies not only are you businesses you also make essential products and uh, you know I, i was very heartened to see that within you know a week of this thing hitting you decided that you were going to at least ensure that some of these essential products and services were made available one issue that uh, I, i thought i might uh, engage you a little bit more on uh, you know you you are a diversified conglomerate you do many many things you are yeah. you are you are in fast moving consumer goods you are in construction you know you are in many uh, spheres i i recognize that all businesses are going through a challenge and clearly government has to step up as esther pointed out this is there's no gain saying that is there an opportunity though because what we are finding on the ground what samita is working on many people don't have a job many people will not be able to go back to a job many businesses will disappear perhaps yeah are there opportunities for example for apprenticeship for skilling for areas in which you may not have a job for these people but can yes, you because yeah. there is evidence that simply classroom training doesn't do anything for anybody but yeah. if they get an opportunity to spend even a week in your factory and yeah. do something interesting there that becomes a passport for a future job is there something you can do and you're thinking about you know going a little bit beyond your day to day uh yeah. what you can do yeah i don't you know if you ask me honestly have i thought about this at, at this moment no but i think that's why we're here to listen to the ideas i think the one complication now is in our factories we can't even have our workers fully in there correct until you have this vaccine and how you know how long will it take to get out a new social distancing norms and and there is going to be a drive for automation also 
how do we do it but the one thing that we've learned that is amazing correct in our agri business 250 farmers are coming for online uh, learning we sell hair color and beauty products salon stylists are coming online for learning so it there is you know i think there's there's that joke going on uh, who digitized your company the ceo cto covid so i think there could be there's you know uh, even in teach for india they they are teaching the kids over whatsapp correct the kids get the phone from the parents for one hour it's not ideal but so i think there could be models like this i think these ideas would have to be uh, explored i think nachiket right now it just it's literally navigate point to point week to week but uh, we should build on these ideas thank you ms godesh for your uh, remarks i will come back to you maybe a little bit later in the conversation let me uh, you know welcome uh, mr metha uh, to the discussion uh, i'm so glad that you were able to join us uh, hey, good evening everyone yes while you were away uh, you know we had a wonderful set of introductory remarks from dr duflo where she spoke about the you know preeminent role the government needs to play and and that we while you know and and ms godrej uh, gave us a you know a, a good example as well as to there are areas in which businesses can do more but really the crisis is too big for any individual corporate or any individual effort to try and uh, address and, and and i'd love to uh, initially get your sense of uh, what you think about that overall area where are the areas in which you think you know particularly narrow areas of course that way there is a whole you know list of things that the government could do but there are other specific areas of focus you think that the government could play a role in and then you know uh, uh, you know to move a little bit to try and uh, go a little bit deeper into what you as a corporate are doing you know and, and when when you were introduced earlier uh, you know i, I said that you're one of the companies that touches every part of the economy from the deepest rural uh, to the high fashion urban uh, you run you know stri shakti programs uh, but you also uh, are involved in very high quality uh, beauty business so you are really you know in the full range uh, of areas how are you responding to it how are you thinking about ask uh, some of these questions yeah narrow question i will just leave with you if you can get to it in your remarks but other if you know and it depends on your uh, preference one of the issues we have seen is that the supply chains have gotten disrupted and in part they've been disrupted because the risk has transferred from the most powerful to the least powerful big companies have tried to protect themselves they have transferred the risk to their supply chain supply chain has transferred the risk to the employee can something be done to reverse that for example credit access i know big companies you know particularly multinational companies don't borrow even though they are actually in very good place to borrow can they use their balance sheet in creative ways to make sure that at least for a while they sure. reverse that trend so i'll stop here you know i'm sure there will be more questions but i'm eager to hear your no, thank you thank you dr moore what i do is i'll give you a you know how we in uh, hindustan unilever have looked at the crisis and uh, what have we done and in many ways i'll answer the several questions that you raised you know we kind of focused on five key areas first is we said this people and when i talk about people it's not just the people who are directly employed by us but we talk about the entire ecosystem yeah which runs into nearly 250000 people so we said first and foremost we need to look after the safety and health so what can we do in terms of training them up helping them change their behavior and in many ways also for instance if they are a frontline sales people to give them a sense of comfort that how can we get for them an insurance so that the family feels much more comfortable that they have got something to depend on when uh, the people men and women go out working in the field yeah so our entire focus was on uh, people and safety that's absolutely primary and that will continue to be the case 
The second one, very important, was keeping the supply lines running. Now, we manufacture essential products, yeah, from sanitizers, soaps, disinfectants, to nutrition products, which boost immunity. So it was very important for us to partner with the government, give them inputs as to how the supply lines can be run in the most safe way, practicing the highest standards of uh, safe behavior. And uh, very importantly, you rightly said that supply chains work in a synchronized manner. You know, I may be having my 29 factories operating, but if my suppliers are not able to supply, yeah, or my truckers are not able to move the goods, then the supply chain will come to a grinding halt. So we had to take the entire ecosystem together with us. So the same standards, what we have adopted in our factory, we've also rolled it out to our suppliers. Yeah, because if they aren't able to function for any reason, then we won't be able to function. Now, when I talk about supply, it is not just the manufacturing bit. You know, we are a company which distribute and kind of the products are consumed by 95% of the households in the country across the spectrum of the society. Wow. So you also have to train up the retailers, for instance. Yeah, so we started a program together with the government of India called Suraksha, where we have trained up hundreds of thousands of retailers on how to operate in a very safe environment. Yeah. The third important bit for us was that we have to have a pulse on the demand. What's happening to the behavior? What's happening to the trends? What are the fears and apprehensions of consumers? So that we could promote our innovation to meet the unmet needs. Yeah? The fourth very important one was, how do you engage with the community? Now, our philosophy is very clear. As HUL, we will not be able to prosper if the country in which we operate is not able to prosper. Yeah. So then we said, okay, we can't be doing everything. We have to supplement the government's efforts. So we said, okay, let's pick it up in a very focused manner. So first is we said, in the big cities that we operate, how could we supplement from a healthcare perspective? Yeah, getting ventilators for them, providing PPEs for them, ensuring that the healthcare workers never run short of sanitizers or soaps, for instance. Yeah, similarly with the civic workers. So that was one area. The second important bit was this entire area of uh, poor people. Yeah, now our factories are dotted across, like I said, um, most of them are in semi-urban and rural area. And we have a big program, which is called Prabhat which is all about helping build the communities around our factories. So we have distributed soaps in millions, food kits to millions of people, so that when they come back from the cities, they don't run around with an empty stomach or they do not even have a soap to wash their hands with and clean themselves with. Yeah, so another big area of focus. Then, uh, you know, we also have a foundation where we work uh, in uh, about 5,000 villages democratizing water management. Again, that gives us a massive reach that allows us to understand what are the stress points and where can we intervene and try to help the communities. Yeah, so that has been another big area where we have devoted a primary objective of democratizing water management to helping the rural folks who are going through a tremendous stress. The other important bit is, as a marketing company, what we are very good at is changing consumer behavior. So we, together with UNICEF, you know, we said, okay, let's come out with simple communications which can go into the heart and emotion of people so that they change their behavior and, and adopt the right practices. Yeah. The last but very important, our ability to contribute would be if we have a sustained business model. So we brought in a heightened focus on cost and liquidity. Now we are a cash rich company, we have zero debt, but 
it's not just about us running. We have 3,500 distributors. We have hundreds of suppliers. We have to ensure that the whole ecosystem runs. Yeah, so these have been, I would say, the five priority areas. Now, you were talking about government, and uh, you're absolutely right. I think we should, uh, I would still like to commend the government, but as far as the saving lives are concerned, they were very decisive, absolutely decisive. I also come from a belief that the world's ability to manage this crisis will, to a large extent, depend on what India does or doesn't do. Yeah? So that bit, I think they've done a great job. There's still hot spots. There will be. And this entire thing about uh, uh, tracing, about isolation, yeah, all that has to move to the next level. We can't be sitting on our laurels. But the next bit is on lives and livelihoods. Yeah, both have to go together. On livelihoods, the government first came out with a package of 170,000 crores, which was uh, providing relief to the most marginal section of the society. And then from a monetary perspective, they came up with the targeted long-term repo operations, which put in another 150, uh, 1.5 lakh crores from a perspective of corporate bonds and promissory notes. So from that perspective, I think the government has started, but you now have to reach a stage where the government has to balance what would be the cost of not acting further, yeah, which I may call it as a cost of inaction further, versus the cost of action? Yeah, and then bring in, I believe they will be doing it. India is a country where 90% of the people work in informal sectors. Yeah, we have a large plethora of MSMEs. We can't let them go under, plain and simple. So whether it is guaranteeing loans, whether it is subsidizing wages, whether it is interest subvention, they will have to move, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that we get the economy going again. I thought these are some remarkable projects that you're engaged in as befits a company that uh, people look up to, has been a bellwether company for decades uh, in India. I'm so pleased to hear it. Just one uh, quick question before I turn to some of our other colleagues uh, to uh, share their thoughts. What do you think is the role of civil society, NGOs, in this work? I know you mentioned UNICEF, uh, but how have you engaged with them? Uh, you know, Ms. Godrej in her remarks said that a lot of the work on the ground that needed to be yeah. done would yeah. be very, very difficult for a corporate to do. They don't know yeah. the need, they don't know the requirements. Yeah. Right? To your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think Nisaba is absolutely right. Uh, this is a time when the entire nation has to come together. And everyone should be playing a role which is in sync with their competencies. Yeah. Now we will we can provide thought leadership. Yeah, we can pinpoint where the issues are. And when it comes to execution, we have several partners, NGO partners. Yeah, who partner with us, who may be absolutely, you know, we are great in market development. We would do a great job of going to say a Dharav Islam and converting the population to using a brands or a categories. Yeah, we are brilliant at that. Yeah, but when it comes to very clearly providing a food package to the needy people, there would be organizations who could be doing a better job than us. It's not that we don't do that. We do it at scale. But then you have to supplement the efforts yeah, so that everyone is able to play a role and you minimize the inefficiencies in the system. You don't want to duplicate efforts. You know, so we have a core team which is completely engrossed in ensuring where we reach, how we reach, who we partner with so that we can make a difference in our own little way. Wonderful, Ms. Smitha. Uh, lovely to hear from you. Uh, let me turn to Ms. Uh, Jabwala uh, to uh, get her thoughts uh, on this issue. Ma'am, you have perhaps more than anybody else uh, the deepest experience of working with 
the informal sector with self-employed women. Uh, you've also uniquely, uh, unlike other NGOs perhaps, really worked with the corporate sector, you know, as partners, as, as people that, that engage uh, on, on questions together. And this idea of shared value that Ms. Bundrin mentioned is very much something that you've seen uh, play out in your work. And, and you've also gone ahead and thought about uh, SMEs, housing, many of these issues that are kind of core to the economy. Uh, it would be wonderful to hear from you, just your thoughts on the discussion so far, but on some of these questions as well. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me for this very interesting panel. Uh, I um, A lot of the points have been made by the uh, other speakers, previous speakers, and I'd like to take up on some of those points. Uh, the first one, which I think uh, uh, Professor Esther Duflo had mentioned, was the importance of transferring cash. Uh, we have been a supporter of um, a basic income, especially to the poor, and uh, our experiments in the rural areas, as well as in the urban areas, we have find, found that the poorest really um, benefit. <clears throat> in fact, a, a regular cash transfer, which comes, uh, at, at come, which is not very big, but comes at a regular intervals every month or every three months, can actually transform their lives completely. And our experiments say in Madhya Pradesh rural areas, we had a large experiment there. We found that the bottom 25%, uh, their lives were really transformed because they used a lot of that cash transfers for productive purposes, not just for consumption, also for consumption, making them better. And when we went back actually five years after we had done one year of cash transfers, we found that uh, the effects were still uh, lingering or they were just as well off because of that just one year. So I would really like to add to my voice too that, and that has come out so clearly in this COVID crisis. If we had had some way that we could transfer <clears throat> a certain minimum, say 5,000 rupees even, to every person who needed it or to every person below a certain income level. Uh, it would have made a huge, huge difference in their lives. Um, and to add to that, I also want to make an um, extra plea, which is that often these, uh, uh, though people have accounts, it's very difficult for them to reach out, to reach to the banks, for the accounts to reach to them. And I want to make a real plea for banking correspondence because we have worked, and those are small micro uh, entrepreneurs who uh, work with the bank to reach out to the most remote areas, to rural areas. And we find that not only does it make uh, banking very easy for people living in these areas, but it is also a, an employment which can be widely, uh, trans widely um, done all over the country. So that's my one important thing that I wanted to say, the whole issue of cash transfers and basic incomes. Um, I'd like to also but say- one point, ma'am, I'd like to interrupt, uh, just to add to what you just said, this issue of cash transfers, there's a new report that came out uh, that shows that there is a 40% failure rate in authentication and on the transaction going through um, with all kinds of issues. And there are two problems. One is that the Aadhaar authentication is not happening. Um, maybe many good reasons, but definitely not happening. The second is that the banking systems are not used to these volumes, I would imagine. I, I don't fully understand what's happening there because they're rejecting or not responding fast enough to the request and then taking a week to refund the money back into the account. Uh, and as you correctly point out, for people who depend on these things. Uh, so I think it's a very powerful point you're making. And I would certainly you know, want, because this are, we can't find the vaccine in two months. This problem we can fix. We know how to do this. Exactly. Sorry, ma'am, back to you. 
No, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And I'm very glad that you emphasize that point because that's our weak point right now, the banking system um, and the system of actually reaching the money. So, and I think it's not a, not a issue that can't be corrected. If, it, if one seriously wanted to reach money to all these people, their corrections can happen. So uh, I'm glad, very glad you brought that point up. Um, I'd also like to um, address your issue question about how corporates and NGOs can work together. Um, I'd like to first say that in this whole crisis, we found that things worked best when there was a real coordination between corporates, uh, NGOs, and uh, the government. And we actually, interestingly, had a very good experience, or perhaps the best experience, in um, one in Ahmedabad, which is see seeing one of the worst uh, effects of COVID, but also in Delhi, where the government had set up a um, coordinating unit between corporates, NGOs, and uh, themselves. And uh, our contribution as a non-governmental organization, and I think that's what non-governmental organizations do best, is identifying the people who are not receiving food. Um, uh, this was actually for distribution of food. And this, you know, this visible face of hunger, the migrants are very obvious the fracture in society has become very obvious. But there's also an invisible face. And I think Esther Duflo also mentioned that a part of that, which is the people who are quietly in their homes, helpless, vulnerable, uh, the seniors you mentioned, the women, female-headed households, widows with small children who don't have time, energy, uh, or know how to go out and get uh, food. So the identification of all these people and bringing them to the attention of the people who are giving the food or who are um, or the government who is giving food or the the uh, corporates who are contributing uh, either money or food and that has been a very good experience i had know that within a few days and this was just where seva was working we reached about 70,000 people just like in a few days, just because of this coordination. And if this kind of coordination can continue, then I think it would really make a very big difference. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was uh, partly that coordination and also for government, uh, I think decentralization is very important. Making decisions from the top and then expecting things will happen. We found that the um, officers at the bottom had very little decision-making power. We also found that uh, the elected representatives, and this is not for Delhi, I'm just talking in general, we work in 14 states, the panchayats, the, um, the elected urban representatives have very little information, very little uh, resources at their disposal, but they're the ones who know best uh, what is going on, what needs to be done. So this whole issue of can't we decentralize more uh, is important. Um, and finally, I just want to say a bit about uh, micro enterprises. Mm, I think we have, according to the NSS, about 6.3 crore um, what that 63 million uh, micro enterprises, which are non agricultural, not even counting the farmers who are also micro enterprises in a way. Um, and these are those with uh, either family, just family work, labors, uh, weavers, food producers, small manufacturers of all kinds, as well as um, uh, as well as those. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, so there are about 63 million of them and uh, they support something like 11.3 um, crore people. Um, and what is happening to them is that whatever little capital they had, they're using up for their daily expenses, for food, for medicines. 
Um, and when the economy begins to open, they will have no liquidity at all. And I think it's very important that they should really be supported at this stage um, as soon as the economy begins to open. Um, and this is something we would need uh, really for the government to do, of course. It needs, there needs to be a package uh, from the government about that. So if the corporates could support something like that, not necessarily only in terms of money, but also uh, to lobby with the government for these very, very small uh, enterprises. But, um, I think that's questions uh, on that. One, I understand that one problem that micro enterprises are facing that their clients, sometimes who can be large companies, public companies, are not making payments to them on time because they know that they are weak, they have no choices, they are delaying payments uh, to them. So that's kind of one narrow issue I'm keen to hear what you think about. But also, you know, given your engagement, ma'am, in the economy and in the system, if you were to look ahead, one year, two year, you know, uh, Dr. Duflo mentioned that is there an opportunity for a reset in, say, education? And that I will talk to Dr. Banerjee about. But do you think we can do something about formalizing the economy a little bit more, giving more structure uh, to the uh, micro enterprise movement so that? They don't again come back into this situation where if there is a risk, the risk transfers straight from them uh, into the micro enterprise sector. So, you know, both one near term issue and a longer term issue. Um, the payment issue, we haven't seen that much, but what we have seen is that all the orders are dried up. Um, and whether the orders will be resumed is, and whether it will be resumed to the same small entrepreneurs is a big question. Uh, the, the, the important thing there is that yes, most of these small entrepreneurs or small micro enterprises are very scattered, they're unregistered. You, even if you wanted to reach out to them, how do you uh, recognize them? And I would say there are two ways that, I, that we have been working on and lots of others have been working on too. One is to collectivize, which is to bring them together for one common purpose. Doesn't mean they all have to work to get uh, produce together, but they can come together, say for finance, or they can come together for a market, or they can come together just to buy a raw material. But as they collectivize, they become more visible and more formalized. And so if anything is to be reached to them, it can be reached to them that way. The other thing I think is important is for the corporates to recognize that these people are part of their supply chain. Because often what happens is that by the time um, the order reaches this very small entrepreneur, for example, a woman who is a weaver at home, the order will come to her through a, a subcontractor, which will come through a contractor, which will come through a big merchant. So by the time it reaches her, uh, the, uh, the big merchant or the big company does not really recognize that she exists and can therefore do nothing for her in terms of either technology or finance or skills. Um, so I think it's important for corporates also to recognize that, that they need, need not deal only with a contractor, but to look down the supply chain to who is these last producers and can we reach this last producer by help, helping them to collectivize? And when you do collectivize, then you can help them with technology, uh, upgrade their productivity, you can help them with skills. So I think that's an important thing for corporates to do. I, I'm sorry to be critical, but corporates are far too dependent on contractors, including labor contractors. I hear you, and these are some very good points you're making. Before I turn to Dr. Banerjee, may I turn back to Mr. Mehta? Uh, I wonder, Mr. Mehta, you had any comments on this issue of the, you're dealing with your supply chain, and I recognize that you are really taking steps to make sure, of both because it's the right thing to do, but also because you know in the long run that business will be needed. But what about in the larger ecosystem? Do you have any comments, any advice? Oh, absolutely. You know, this is a crisis. 
which uh, has a uh, uh, potential to impact supply side demand side as well as financial linkages a company like ours or a consumption story really progresses in the country when there are two important ingredients when you have more money in the hands of more people and the second is consumer confidence yeah so absolutely we need to have a direct transfer of money to the marginal sections of the people the biggest risk we have over the last 20 years about 20% of our country's population on an average of 1% a year moved up from bottom of pyramid to the lower middle class the risk is they could fall back into the bop yeah and we shouldn't let that happen and the second important bit is about confidence yeah you need to give confidence to the industry you need to give confidence to the consumers you know many people uh, you, you start uh, compressing demand when people start feeling that their wealth has eroded when they start feeling that they don't have a hope for a better future when they fear for their livelihood that's when they stop spending and then you get into a vicious trap now these are two very important things with the country should definitely do give a boost of confidence that within of course we don't have an economy like 8 trillion dollars that we can spend 2 and 1/2 trillion dollars just to give a boost or a stimulus or give uh, uh, you know 500 billion dollars to the fed which will have a multiplier impact of 10x we can't do that we'll have to live within our means but even within our means i think we can stretch much more to ensure that the economy doesn't stall and once that happens and if we are able to control the pandemic i think we will come out perhaps stronger than when we entered the crisis thank you mr mehta uh, may i turn to ms godrej just for a quick uh, set of remarks on this question of so gonna uh, have to call me nisa if you want me to answer a question <laughs> Nina, sorry it's getting too uh, formal you know, do you have any comments on you know uh, madam jabala said something important about the supply chain the msmes micro enterprises uh you know again your perspective would be quite important you have you know a vast network of uh, people that you deal with yeah no i and you know like i said oh uh, i think it's critical on both the lives and livelihoods so you know i think what sanjeev is saying in terms of whether it's the retail stores whether it's your supply chain how do you keep them safe and that's what i was saying about shared value is exactly the same right now because if you don't do it you can't uh uh you can't sort of operate i think supply chains one of the things that we are also going to look look at is not just efficiency and resilience so that might also give uh quite a bit of opportunity to go down in the supply chain like i said there might be automation also but uh, you know you're going to probably have a more distributed supply chain and that is going to create opportunities uh, for people i think we don't know what the geopolitical shifts are going to be but i think one is how do you give the economy a stimulus and two is how do you hustle to make sure in the de- geopolitical shifts uh, that india takes uh, takes advantage of that so we can build up on sort of manufacturing jobs and stuff so you already see obviously while demand is falling for certain products say something as simple as sanitizer it's going way up and there are hundreds of products like that where the demand will be you know as sir mentioned the ppe so i think we um you know we really have to keep our supply chains uh both safe we have to think of finance structured finance uh to them and then as a country and even as a corporate really think uh how can you uh you know pivot your businesses for uh for the future thank you very much um may i tell may, you may may i say something controversial yeah yes ma'am yes ma'am please i just wanted to ask people from the corporate sector especially that government is talking about labor laws changing labor laws uh to make workers work 12 hours a day 6 days a week um in order to bring the economy back to normal but they are not uh, talking about any form of social security for the workers 
And I was just wondering, and I thought that was rather, um, for those people who have suffered the most to force them to work so hard, uh, I, I thought it was not really fair. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to give them a social security net so that they could then work, they would want to work, maybe not 12 hours a day, but as hard as they can. Let me take this question, please. Yeah, this is not about either or. Of course, social security has to be given. But when you look at it from a lens of 12 hour shift, one has to understand that you would be able to run the factories with far fewer workers and uh, the risk of infection would go down significantly. All the things you talk about, social distancing, etc., you would be able to practice that. But that does not mean that you don't give them rest. That does not mean you give them wages commensurate with working for 12 hours. Yeah, that does not mean you don't give them social security. But there is an inherent benefit of instead of having 100 workers, you could be working with two-thirds the number of workers and significantly reduce the risk of infection. That's where the benefit of this 12-hour shift comes in. So, thank you, Mr. Mehta. You know, uh, I want to turn to Dr. Banerjee. She's been listening to us patiently. She brings a unique perspective that I want to be sure we have enough time for. Maybe if there's time, we can circle back, uh, ma'am, on some of these uh, questions. So, Dr. Banerjee, uh, you know, obviously, Pratham is no longer just an education NGO. You work in so many different sectors and almost everything that was discussed here, you would have something important to say. Uh, I do want, uh, though, in your remarks for you to spend a little bit of time also on the education space as to, you know, is, is this reset? Because it seems like a crisis that could really set us back. You know, jobs may come back, may come in different ways. What uh, Nisaba was saying was demands will shift, skills will shift, we could retrain, reskill. But what happens to the children? They're out of school now. Um, what is the future going to look like? What can we do today? Is there an opportunity for a learning to read, a small, quick initiative that a corporate volunteer can make sure that the child stays on top of things? Um, and that maybe gives a little bit of a catch up effect. But I, I would love to hear your perspective because this is a set of questions we're getting flooded with from the audience as well as to what about education? So, uh, Nachiket, like uh, Nisaba said, my name is Rukmini, and you should call me that. Uh, uh, I think that the whole education uh, part, I think, is at a very interesting juncture. And Esther referred to it by saying that perhaps this is an opportunity for a serious reset. If I look at what is happening right now, uh, I think that there is a whole bunch of things which even in education has accelerated. So uh, if I take, uh, you know, just even our own experience, uh, we have a direct, uh, you know, we work in two ways. One is we work with the government and the other is we work directly with schools and communities. And <clears throat> I was absolutely, I think, uh, taken aback about how quickly without any prior preparation, our teams were able to connect with the communities and with the children with which whom we work. Uh, within about two weeks, I think first it was a phone contact and obviously the kids that we work with are government school children, largely rural. And so we realized that uh, this dependence on smartphones is not going to work. And therefore we went back to how do you uh, connect through SMS? How do you connect uh, through actually just exactly like how you do with your family. Can people call? Can you establish? And we figured out that places where we had strong relationships, communities with whom we had strong relationships, we often have children's groups. Uh, we work inside the school, but we have children's groups outside the school, that if you were able to get one anchor, then within a week, you were able to reach more and more people. So the power of the technology reaching was uh, greatly uh, premeditated by the uh, boss, by the fact that there were social structures through which this could go, and there was a human contact before. So, like uh, you know, I mean, these are all very obvious things. But I think in a crisis, it's all your relationships which begin to work, and therefore having these strong relationships, uh, both inside the school and outside, so that when school is closed, the outside can play a big role. The second, I would say, is that. 
parents and you know everybody's talking about all the middle class parents whose children are on zoom and so on but i've been very also impressed by the way that uh, rural parents particularly parents who don't have smartphones so they are probably at the lower end of the distribution have responded to the small simple activities that we are sending uh, we see uh, maybe this is because of the lockdown we see a lot of fathers participating which normally uh, they don't and therefore i think we have to as a education system we have to totally rethink the role of parents because the different kinds of parents in different ways have demonstrated that they can play a very active and engaging role and that brings me to the fact that uh, you know uh, in our work with governments we see that suddenly a lot of space has opened up for collaboration wow usually partnering with the government takes its own time you know there are its own challenges but right now because everybody and again i think this is what nisaba was saying about a shared value you want to reach out you want to connect as much as you can and therefore people are reaching out in many different ways so we've seen governments across the board trying new things in a very rapid speed uh, you know uh, again i think that uh, the realization that smartphones are uh, you know uh, in uh, majority of children especially the children who need you may or may not have access to smartphones we see different governments trying uh, himachal government for example has taken up this whole sms mode of uh, 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 connecting we see schools and teachers who already had the social connects with their children are able to operate really much faster because then the teachers are the node and you can give it further up but if your teachers were not connected to the community then uh, technology just just content cannot you know cannot help but we are seeing a lot of experimentation within the government happening at a rapid speed collaborations of multiple parties not just one on one and i think these are all very uh, important indications for the future if i just look into the future i think that this is going to be not just in india everywhere the most anticipated school opening of all time you know everybody will be done <laughs> to go back to school and i think we should ride that i think that this is a fantastic thing for education when parents children and everybody wants to go back to school because schools functioning again will be the signal that we are more or less back to routine life schools were the first to open and schools will open in a staggered way what renana was saying about decentralization i think you're going to have to leave when will schools open to a local authority because it will depend greatly on what the local conditions are so i have three dreams for when schools open and hopefully this will fit into Esther's dream for a reset i think that you must spend time welcoming everybody back to school give people you know somebody asked me the other day that uh, you know schools are closed so children are not learning i said to the contrary schools are closed and children are learning i love a lot and they are also deciding what to learn because they are seeing how people in their own family in their own community are dealing with all kinds of situations they've learned what to do uh, in scarcity so i think children have learned a lot and we as adults have to spend time in learning from children what they have learned so that we can then build on that uh the second thing is i think that you have to give kids this has been a big closure studies that have been done there was some study done in pakistan after the earthquake happened which showed that children went back year or two mm-hmm. in terms of at least academic learning and therefore i completely think that you know there should be no rush to rush into the curriculum we need to spend this time to really build our foundations again india needed these most indian children needed these building of the basic reading basic arithmetic and let's take our time to do that 2020 is an unusual year if we build those foundations well we'll be able to leap up in a far better way in the future i think there is also a big need to refocus on the fact that we've come a long way in terms of enrollment but we need that enrollment to be translated into real attendance immediately because school meals are going to play a very big role in terms of providing nutritional security i think the fact that school meals can be a place where a lot of people contribute there may be cases where teachers live far away and therefore the fact that a lot of migrants are coming back we need to think about how that experience anybody who has traveled and lived somewhere else can contribute a lot in the broader learning of uh, of what children can do i think there is schools have grounds they have land how can you convert that and, and uh, you know enable the community 
as well as the children to be thinking about kitchen gardens. Uh, I spoke to one of uh, Mr. Mehta's colleagues today uh, in, the, in the Hindustan Diva Foundation, but how can this be actually turned into not just something that schools provide, but and not just nutritional security, but something to which a whole con community can contribute. So how do you make this whole community school reconnect? We are going to see increase of enrollment in government schools. Low cost private schools are going to be not very good shape. People will return that will return to government schools. Uh, how do we do, you know, um, manage larger numbers of children in schools, given all the safety precautions, we might have to go to double shifting. But I think that things like if Narega would allow uh, people to actually teach children, I think you would be able to both create some meaningful livelihood, as well as some real value add uh, where we are at. So I, uh, you know, across the board, I think this is a great time to reimagine how you can make the school the center of the community, whether it is in an urban area or in a rural area, and how you can use a school which has space, which has land, which has, uh, in many cases, the ability to uh, uh, generate food, uh, become both not just part of academic learning, but really a kind of, uh, you know, going back to what, you know, originally common schools were meant for. So let's see how much of this happens. I caution against this business as usual and you know having to finish exams and all of that, we can blame this uh, Rakshas called COVID for all the bad things and focus on what are the possible new ways of doing things and give children and families a time to settle in. School is a very safe place. It's a place where you can leave aside the reality of your life for some time. And uh, you, know, you can also participate much more easily in a school than say in a hospital. And therefore, it's a one public institution that I think we need to strengthen and which will, I think, automatically become strengthened if you just allow local uh, you know, initiative to take place. Um, I have some thoughts on a lot of the other things, but I'll stop now because I know you have not much time. These are some wonderful remarks, uh, Vinny, and very inspiring, very energizing. I've always, you know, everybody, the narrative is the migrant is the issue. We have to, you know, there are issues we need to solve. The first time I'm hearing you know, an opportunity to bring that experience into the lived experience of a child and enriching the child's uh, experience. That's just wonderful. Unfortunately, we have very limited time left. I want to turn back to Dr. Duflo. And, uh, you know, she's heard all of the captains of civil society and business uh, express their point of view. Uh, I'm keen to hear what she makes of it, what is her overall sense, uh, and any other guidance that she has to offer us. Uh, as to how we think forward. This was, uh, this was really uh, fabulous. And thank you very much for giving me this uh, opportunity for being part of this panel and from, to hear from uh, Rukmini and Isaba and Renana and Sanjeev and yourself, Nachiket. Um, I think the um, one thing that I think Sanjeev said is that the way that India manages this is going to be a bit of a harbinger of how the way the world is managing this, both because of the sheer size of India and because of the, the number of poor people there are in India. And there are things to be proud of as Indians or friends of India and in how things have been done. For example, the fact that the epidemic itself is, has been so far rather successfully contained. And there are things where uh, we could have done uh, better. And I, I, I think Renana's point about like the, the, the simple infrastructure of delivering cash not being in place is something that, you know, all of us collectively, <laughs> the government, the business, the NGO, we should A, not be, you know, we, not be proud that we were not ready because at some level, the objective had to be, was to be ready with the, uh, the trilogy of bank account, cell phone and electronic money. And um, I, I know people get sometimes uh, offended when I compare India to Africa. So I apologize in advance, but it is worth nothing that many people, many countries in Africa have an infrastructure of electronic money that is so much more developed. And the small country of Togo was able to put in place a cash transfer that within three days reached 1 million people. 
in their population of 8 million. Now, of course, Togo has a different size and, you know, that, that's a different problem to deal with Togo and to deal with India, which is a much, much larger country. But that should give us a, a sense that this is feasible. And no point looking backwards. It's feasible looking forward. If all of the people present in this school put their mind to it, it can be done. And uh, it's not just the government and it's not just the... Uh, business and it's not just the NGO. I think all of everyone can coalesce around making sure that this essential this 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 is happening. I was also very encouraged uh, by hearing uh, everyone here thinking about this uh, not only as a crisis but as an opportunity. And in uh, in France, where I'm from, uh, we have this discussion in very abstract and uh, uh, kind of uh, dreamy terms of, you know, what's the future that we want and, uh, uh, you know, think about uh, the, the role of consumption in our society, which is fine. That's discussions that are good to have. But I think what was very uh, uh, empowering in this discussion and what I would really like uh, people to take away with them is that that's actually not a dreamy conversation. It's a conversation to have like right now. And what uh, um, uh, Nisaba and Raji was tell were telling us about the relationship with supplier on the supply chain and seeing people uh, and, and consumers as well and seeing them not as pawn in the game, but as partners. Uh, what Rukmini is just telling us about, this is a moment to make, you know, to change the place that school have in villages and to make it the center of a community in a way that many people would be so happy to meaningfully give and could, you know, turn, um, you know, it's, it could be much more than a silver lining. It could really be, uh, uh, it's a concrete what she's outlining and what Renana, Nisabal and uh, San, Sanjeev all, all have outlined are concrete steps, you know, in the type that I like, which is little, you know, put one, break and then another break and then another break and build something, even in this situation that seems otherwise quite hopeless. So I think there is a lot of work for governments and we should not forget that it's been reset again by all participants. There is also a lot of work for all the other members of the communities, um, NGOs and, uh, and uh, businesses and also just citizens. And what was outlined today is many ways in which we are we have the ability of getting citizens in, you know, to keep being part of a collective effort, not let anybody drop out of the bandwagon from the migrant worker to the isolated old person, keep them back by reaching out through the old fashioned technology of cell phone and not just through Zoom calls, and then give them a role in what's coming next. And I think if you can do that, and if, if we can do that, because I would like to be a part of this as well, I think if we can do that, then then this will this could you know out of this could potentially emerge uh, uh, also a, a, a stronger society at the local level as well as at the national level. Thank you, Esther. These are some wonderful remarks and very encouraging, very inspiring. Um, you know, we are unfortunately almost out of time. There are many, many questions. But one question that, you know, I, I do want to raise with uh, Nisaba that uh, she may have a unique perspective as uh, somebody that runs an Indian business that also exports, that also imports. Uh, people want to know, what does it mean for globalization? You had said that geopolitical environment may change, demand may go up, may go down. What are you seeing? Is there something that your businesses are telling you about what's going to happen there. Just yeah. if you can share. I wish I said, I, I wish I could say I knew 100%, but I don't, so I'll put that out there first. Uh, but I do think given the US-China relationships and given what we're seeing and the need to have resilient supply chains, because if 80% of one product comes from Italy or from China, and then you've, you know, everything is stopped because of that, I think supply chains, at least from the corporate world or even the medical world, will get distributed. And I think uh, if countries, uh, if India, you know, thinks about that, because if we can get manufacturing going 
more as a country i think that's a big opportunity to build uh build jobs i think that's how china build uh built their economy so i think that's something both the government and uh corporates need to think about correct and in the last uh you know couple of months i have got emails from you know big american companies saying we're looking to set up uh set up in india would you be interested in a conversation to manufacture of a different thing so this is going to uh this is going to happen in the same way we do a lot of business in africa actually uh, across the across the continent where we you know we employ thousands and thousands uh thousands and thousands of people you know there it's also working with governments to say uh you know make you know don't be as protective as india but make your economy stronger by really thinking through uh you know the chinese are putting in all the money and building your ports and doing that but they also dumping in very cheap goods without paying any tariffs correct so i think there will be these geopolitical shifts i think it's uh uh you know each each country and uh you know organizations need to think through how to do this uh in the best way possible so thank you all we are at 8 o'clock um and uh, taken up a lot of your time 90 minutes you've sat through and given us some really remarkable insights I, i must say i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out i want to thank uh, the organizers samita and idfc uh, institute for setting this up and the enormous number of panelists who listened patiently and i can see on my right hand side the chat is just the level of engagement is very very high we could have gone on for several hours on this so thank you all and uh, have a good night good morning depending on which time zone you are on uh, and i hope that we get a chance to do it again maybe not tomorrow but in some time in the future thank you so much thank you thank you thank you for sharing